Hi, my name is Mike Jensen. I'm a retired professional photographer and a hobbyist astrophotographer. I also belong to my local camera club and that's why I'm doing this presentation. It started out as a presentation to them and I decided I wanted to uh, record it and uh, share it with the public on YouTube. So uh, that's, that's why we're here. Um, the title of the talk is, You Must Have a Really Good Camera. It's kind of a joke, a play on words. Uh, from people commenting about pictures and how good that picture is and wow you must have a really good camera it's kind of a joke because people you know say that all the time to to different people but they don't say it to uh, serious people like a baker hey you must have a really good oven uh, your your bread is so good or things like that or you know a cook you you must have really good pans because your your food is so great uh, but they they all say it about photographers and so it's just kind of a play on words Anyhow, my goal with this presentation is really to recognize a lot of the uh, astrophotographers in my astronomy club. I've worked with them a lot. I've learned a lot from them. And I wanted to recognize them and also expose this hobby of astrophotography to uh, people who might just be astronomy observers and thinking about getting into it, as well as the public. Uh, into what is, I think, the most difficult and uh, but still rewarding hobbies out there. Okay, so just to be clear, I'm not in charge of the clouds. A lot of people think I am, but I'm not. I'm not in charge of the clouds. I have no astrophotography credentials other than just volunteering to do this talk. I was a professional photographer for a number of years. I led a lot of workshops. I was selected as a fine art uh, photographer of the year. Um, I've been doing deep sky for uh, a couple of years since November of 2022. I kind of started in it uh, dancing around it a little bit in uh, 2020, decided to buy some gear. And then of course uh, COVID hit and it took forever to get gear. So um, I also want to note, I really appreciate the friendships and the acquaintances I've made through my uh, astrophotography club and through our special interest group that we have. Okay, so let's get serious. How do you get started in astrophotography? My first suggestion is to join an astronomy club. I did this in November of 2020, and uh, I did it because I was starting to get serious about doing this, and I really wanted to kind of um, pick the brains of like-minded people and pick the brains of astrophotographers and get to know the night sky and find out what tools they're using and things like that. So. The, the best way I thought was to join the astronomy club and I'm really really glad I did. I've met a lot of great people and uh, really have a lot of uh, friends that uh, I've met through the astronomy club. I even started a special interest group within our astronomy club just for astrophotographers and we have a blast. Okay so let's talk about how we get started in astrophotography. Based on what I've seen you can either be a photographer looking to get more serious into it, or you can be an existing astronomer looking to take pictures and uh, you know kind of keep those uh, those things that um, that you see in the night sky. Bottom line is you get a lot more detail from taking pictures than you do from observing. A lot of observers just don't want to get into all the intricacies that we have um, in taking pictures and things like that, and that's okay but uh, they just won't get the same detail that we get uh, from astrophotography. I asked a lot of people, asked them on Facebook, uh, why did you get into this? You know, some people said, oh, I was a Civil War reenactor and my knees got bad. I had to do something different. Um, some people got interested like me uh, as a young child. Um, some people uh, take a note from their, their parents and looked at the night sky. Um, Folks in my group were gifted uh, astronomy gear or started out very early and kind of evolved into it. Um, okay, so what's the best approach? Um, in my opinion, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. You can either just kind of dance around it and get into it nice and slowly and very deliberately, or you can just jump in, you know, in the deep end and, uh, and do it that way. I kind of started very deliberately and took a couple of years to really learn a lot more about astronomy, to learn uh, what kind of photography gear I would need, and then slowly started to acquire that. Um, 
So anyhow, for wide field or station, uh, stationary camera, these are the kind of setups on this left-hand picture that you might see people using for taking pictures of the Milky Way or the night sky or nightscapes, things like that. A camera, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, a tripod. Uh, your targets might be, like I said, the Milky Way, the starscapes, the sun, the moon, comets, eclipses. Uh, you don't get any guiding on this. Uh, I'll talk about guiding later. Basically, guiding is pointing a separate telescope and camera uh, at the same night sky and, and picking out a guide star to kind of help keep all your gear um, uh, moving uh, the way it needs to be using. Um, processing software, you're probably going to use Lightroom, Photoshop, maybe Topaz, things like that. Uh, those are the ones I recommend. Uh, I can't imagine spending all the money that we spend on camera gear and things like that and not buying the best out there for processing. And that's really Lightroom and Photoshop and Topaz for, for uh, getting rid of noise, things like that. Okay, so you want to get a little bit more serious, take some longer exposures, things like that. You're going to move into buying a star tracker. Uh, I have the Star Adventurer. And uh, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a tracker that moves in one direction. Um, and you're going to attach a camera, DSLR, mirrorless. You can attach a dedicated astro camera to this as well. Um, but most people start out with uh, what they have. They have a DSLR. They have a lens. Let's go with that. Um, basically, you're going to put it on top of your tripod. And your targets are probably going to be a lot the same. Milky Way, some different starscapes. You're going to take a lot of pictures. You're going to stack them. Uh, you might be shooting the sun. You might be shooting the moon. Uh, comets, eclipses, nebulas, and galaxies. I, I've done all of these. Also, you got to remember, when you're shooting the sun, uh, you're not going to be looking directly into that, into your viewfinder or your uh, eyepiece. Um, guiding, you can do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that down the road. Uh, there is capturing software available uh, for this approach, probably NINA or ASI. Uh, there's a lot of different processing softwares uh, out there. The Starry Starry Landscape Stacker that uh, is available on um, Apple, uh, Sequitur that's available on um, for Windows. Uh, you can use Astro Pixel Processor. It's a bit advanced for this work. Uh, you can use Pix and Sight, same kind of approach, very advanced. Uh, deep Sky Stacker, um, and you're probably going to use at some point Lightroom and Photoshop and Topaz Denoise. Okay. Okay. So if you if you kind of gotten through that and you decided I really want to shoot Deep Sky stuff, um, you're going to get into some serious gear now. Um, you're going to need a go-to mount. Uh, you're going to need probably some dedicated cameras. Uh, you're probably going to move into a telescope versus a typical lens uh, at this step. Um, you're going to have deeper targets, although you can still shoot Milky Way. Uh, you can still shoot the sun and the moon. You can still shoot comets. You can shoot eclipses. You can shoot nebulas. You can shoot galaxies. There are many, 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 many possibilities for image gathering. There's many possibilities for stacking and processing. All right. You can also do solar and planetary um, uh, photography with this. I've shown a couple of different uh, lenses uh, or filters that you can get. You can get specialized uh, solar uh, telescopes. Um, you can get a more specialized telescope to shoot the moon as well. Um, and uh, here you're going to get, like I said, you're going to get into guiding. Uh, in these pictures, you see a smaller telescope up top with a little red kind of looks like a lipstick uh, container. That's a, that's a guiding camera. It's a smaller, it's black and white. It just gets out there, finds some stars to track, and uh, then it talks to your software. Okay, so what does it really, really take to be an effective astrophotographer? Obviously, a little bit of a play on the words. You don't just point the, the thing at the sky. You've got to have a lot of skills. And uh, no matter how many skills you have now, you're going to develop new ones. And uh, you're going to have to uh, look at these skills that you have and really uh, compound on those. You have to be good at networking, both people and wires. You have to be a, a weather forecaster, a prognosticator. 
Um, nobody wants to be in charge of the clouds, but you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to set up tonight? Am I going to go to that dark sky area? Or, or am I going to stay in? Um, you're going to have to know some astronomy, mostly where no north is um, and how to pull our line and things like that. But it's really good to know the constellations and uh, really good to know some of your main stars out there. Uh, you're going to need some technical knowledge, internet, electrical, computer networking, where to find answers. Uh, YouTube is a great resource, although you remember uh, you're seeing me on YouTube. And um, also, you're going to see a lot of people on YouTube. Some may know a little bit about what they're talking about. Some may not. Remember, it's one person's approach. Um, you need to know what you want to shoot. Uh, is it wide field? Is it deep sky? Uh, what kind of... Uh, aperture and what kind of focal length are you going to need. You're going to need software for image capturing. Uh, you're going to need software for image processing. Uh, you need to know what a flattener is, a reducer, what guiding is. These are all skills that you're just going to have to kind of pick up along the way. Uh, there are some books, there are some resources for them, uh, but uh, quite frankly my uh, best source of, of learning is sitting next to an astrophotographer who's doing this and kind of picking their brain and learning from them. Um, it's really good to be methodical and make a checklist as you go along. And oh, by the way, you're going to need some funding. If you're going to get really serious in this, you're probably going to need somewhere between, say, $3,000 to $10,000. Um, I hate to say that, but that's what it's going to take. Um, you, you don't have to do it all, all at once, but a lot of people, like they, they, they're ready. When they're ready, they're ready. Um, I kind of took a slower approach. A lot of that was because I did it during the COVID pandemic, and it was harder to get gear. Okay, so why do you even want to think about doing this? This is one of the hardest hobbies out there. In my area in southwest Florida, we're lucky to get maybe 12 to 15 images a year. Some people get as high as 40. Um, but uh, why would you want to do this? Real simple. Stamp collecting and coin collecting, that's boring. Baseball cards, that's real expensive. You talk about expensive, uh, how expensive astrophotography is. Baseball cards are outrageous. Uh, golf is fun. You can do that during the day if you want, but, but it's probably going to take you a long time to learn. Uh, fishing, you got to buy a boat. Uh, landscape and people photography, uh, I've been doing that for many, many years. Uh, it is not real easy to master. That's kind of a joke. Um, and just observing the night skies, that's really not doing it for me. I love sitting out there uh, in, in, in an empty night sky situation and just looking up and looking at the stars, waiting for meteors and, and uh, watching for satellites and things like that. But uh, it's really cool to take the pictures. Okay, so we asked some experts what it took. Uh, one of my good friends, Linwood Ferguson, says um, astrophotography was invented to satisfy the most obsessive masochist. Everything else falls from there. Um, he says mostly uh, patience and an insatiable desire to see what's in the sky. I think that really hits home. You have to have a real big desire, uh, almost a relationship with what's in the sky. Um, you have to strike a balance between what your ambitions are what skies you have, uh, what your equipment is, your budget, things like that. Have to have some realistic uh, expectations. Um, it's really important to understand that you have to be obsessive about this. You can't just kind of skim by it. When you're going to get this serious, when you're going to learn all these new softwares and buy all this gear, you need to know that you're going to have to stick with it for a while and, and, and keep after it. Oh, by the way, I meant to tell um, this image of the Witch Head Nebula. The reason I put this in there is that, uh, you know, this took Linwood a long, long time to get this image. It's an awesome image. But uh, when you're shooting at this this uh, subject, um, you've got this huge star called Rigel up there in the way. And it really kind of confounds the whole thing into this uh, nebula that they call the witch head. So you're going to have a lot of other things up in the sky that are getting in your way. Um, what does it take when you're doing deep sky uh, photography? What does it take? Basically, you're going to take four different types of shots. You're going to take what we call lights. These are basically 
the images you're shooting of the sky. You're going to take probably tens or dozens or hundreds of them. Uh, the one I'm showing here, it's in black and white because I shoot in mono and then I assign a uh, filter uh, color to that uh, mono picture. Um, you're also going to shoot what's called darks. Darks are shot at the same uh, exposure length, uh, the same setup on your camera or your uh, uh, Astro Cool camera. As your lights, you just do it with a cap on and cover it up entirely in the dark. You're doing this to get the signal and the noise uh, and figure out what the, 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 the signature values of that camera are when it's entirely dark. Uh, you're also going to shoot bias frames. These are basically noise readout uh, uh, pictures taken at a much faster uh, exposure. And you're going to take flats. Flats are used to help you um, determine if you have spots on the lens or dust in the lens uh, or the sensor, things like that, uh, that can really make a, a big impact on your pictures. Uh, the software takes a look at these flats and then kind of helps you filter them out. So those are your four types of shots. So again, I'm talking difficult. I'm talking very um, methodical. You've got to really be dedicated to do this. Okay, so how did I get hooked? Well, early on, I started uh, really getting involved in, in photography. Here's a picture of me at age five. Um, and uh, I started out, uh, you know, I wanted to hold the light meter. I wanted to hold the camera. By 17, I had a dark room. Uh, and we went to a lot of NASA launches in the 1960s, the Gemini, the Mercury, the Apollo programs. And I was really a big, big, big space fan. I've still got a lot of uh, mementos and keepsakes from, uh, from those days. Uh, my parents retired to Central Florida. We used to see the, the uh, space shuttle come on downwind approach and break the sound barrier right over our house. So that's kind of what got me into it. I got a, a telescope at an early age. It was one that looked a lot like this. It's a real crappy telescope. Um, really hard to see things in, in the sky because the thing kept moving. You couldn't even get close to touching it. Uh, you had to um, uh, just look through the, the eyepiece. And I vowed someday I want to really, really get a good telescope. OK, look at this image. This is an image uh, taken at Sparks Lake outside of Bend, Oregon. Um, it wasn't far from my home. And this is one of the images that really got me into taking pictures at night. Uh, it was taken uh, around the uh, summer solstice in June. Uh, I had a full moon coming up over the, uh, the back of my shoulder. Uh, I had gone up there to get a sunset image, and that just fizzled out. You can see there's barely any clouds in the sky. But this was taken at 10 o'clock at night with a full moon rising. And I could see there was a whole different possibility of things that I could do um, in the night sky. Um, so I went back. And uh, this is maybe a couple of years later. Uh, I kept going back and I kept shooting later into the night, later into the night. This might be, I don't know, um, one o'clock in the morning, something like that, two o'clock in the morning. You're getting some really cool detail. Uh, you're getting the Milky Way up in the upper right hand corner. You can see Andromeda. Um, and these are probably, I don't know, uh, 30, 40 uh, second exposures. And um, this is back in the days when you didn't do a composite of the foreground and the, uh, the night sky. This is all one exposure. OK, a couple of things really happened that really propelled astrophotography over the years. We had digital really start to get serious, digital photography, uh, 2001, 2002. Um, in uh, 2007, um, Steve Jobs came out and announced the first iPhone. That was huge because that put a camera in a lot of people's hands. And they then instantly thought they were uh, professional photographers and they knew what they were doing. Um, and then Facebook, it started in 2004 and went mobile in 2007. Once again, as soon as the iPhone came out. Another big thing that changed astrophotography, I mentioned it before, the COVID pandemic. All these people are forced to stay at home and they decided to um, go after a hobby that they've been thinking about for years and they started buying up all this astronomy gear. The shelves were empty at uh, all the supply houses and the online uh, resources. 
uh, it took a long time to get um, astronomy gear. So those two big things really impacted it. Um, all right, so let's talk about a really, really simple approach. What do you need to get a picture of the night sky? You need a camera. You need a decent camera. I suggest probably mirrorless. Do the research online. Uh, you need a lens. A uh, really good deep sky lens is like a 135 uh, millimeter. Uh, you need a tripod. You can add a go-to mount to it, and you need some processing software. I recommend Lightroom and Photoshop to start with. Um, what else do you need to learn? You need to learn a little bit about photography exposure, uh, something called the exposure triangle. Um, the exposure triangle is the relationship between the shutter speed, the aperture, which is the lens opening the, the width of your lens, and the ISO or the gain, which is the sensor's sensitivity uh, to light. Those three things work together to give yourself a good picture. Um, there's a lot of different approaches to ISO and to gain and to cameras. Uh, I shoot the Sony A1. It's a very expensive camera. Um, the uh, ISO goes up to an outrageously high uh, number, um, but typically you're going to want to shoot between 5,000 10,000 ISO for uh, wide field shots. I don't use the Sony A1 for deep sky. I have a dedicated uh, astro camera like the one on the right. Uh, I shoot this ZWO 1600. Uh, these are great, cool cameras. They have a fan in them. They, they cool the, uh, the sensor down. Uh, you want a cooler sensor. The sensors heat up when you take longer exposures. Okay, again, I mentioned aperture. Again, this is the opening of the lens. Uh, the blades of the, the lens here uh, open up and let as much light in as possible. Uh, you may he uh, hear a lot of people talking about something like that's called an OTA. It's really simple, optical tube assembly. It's this. This is your telescope. An OTA, same thing. Uh, telescopes have an aperture as well as a focal length. Focal length is length of the tube. Aperture is the width of the opening of the lens. Okay, now, longer exposures. I mentioned them. This is the whole piece of astrophotography that makes it possible. Um, look at some of the pictures I was able to take with longer exposures in the night sky. You're going to use a wide open uh, aperture. So uh, with a camera, you're talking f4 is good, f2.8 is better, f1.4, 1.8 is awesome. Uh, ISO 4000, 6000, 10000, something like that. Uh, these were taken up in the uh, um, Cascade Mountains uh, outside of my home when I lived in Oregon. Um, 40, uh, 40 second exposure on the right. Uh, and then I took like a 10, 12 minute exposure um, and um, did some star trails. This is all one exposure, not stacked. Here's another shot. This is actually a panorama of uh, Crater Lake taken during mid-December. It was terribly, terribly, terribly cold, six below. Um, I got there and um, I had to crawl up, climb up on uh, about seven or eight feet of snow. I set up my tripod. I took one shot. I could not see anything. I just knew where the lake was. And uh, I saw the results after a 20 second exposure and I kind of jumped for joy and I thought, okay, this is going to be awesome. Um, the lights at the uh, bottom of the uh, foreground are uh, cities that are probably 150 miles away. That much light pollution that far. Uh, this is a Bortal 2 location. Um, you can see Andromeda. Uh, again, we're talking 20 second exposures here. And this is the detail that you get. Uh, Andromeda is in the upper left, the Milky Way. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Again, I moved into trackers. Uh, I put my camera, my lens on a tracker, and I was able to do this photograph on the right. Uh, it's called the Horsehead and Flame Nebula. Uh, it's a favorite of uh, a lot of beginners. It's a favorite of mine now. Um, this was taken at uh, ISO 3200 with 30 second exposures. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I'd really bump up that ISO, maybe 6,000, 6,400, something like that. 
Um, and uh, I, like I said, I, I used what I had. I had a 1-400 to 400 lens. I put that on my sky tracker. That's what would make weight. And I just started shooting away. Okay, here's another one. This was taken on a fixed tripod. I took this at the very large array in New Mexico. It's about 8,000 feet elevation. Uh, probably a Bortle II uh, area. Uh, I had some backlighting from a work garage that was probably about a half a mile away. Um, and I had to do this fast because I had a ranger there who was like wanting me to get out of there. He didn't want me there. Um, they'd had about four inches of snow in the morning. That snow melted and gave me a really, really cool reflection. Um, so if you're going to take wide field, make sure that you've got something cool in the foreground. Uh, hopefully something that can help light it. Uh, if not, maybe bring some lighting of your own. Bring a flashlight or some uh, uh, some some uh, other types of lighting. Um, I use these uh, these loom cubes um, here that uh, help uh, light foregrounds as well. Um, anyhow, another great picture. Uh, here's some here's one I took in Colorado. Uh, this is a place called Beaver Lake in the Uncompahgre Forest. Uh, in between Cimarron and Ridgeview uh, in uh, western Colorado. Uh, here's a, a photo by a colleague of mine, Phil Jansen. I, Phil is always traveling around, taking some really great pictures wherever he goes. Uh, okay, so why do you need a tracker or a mount that moves? Well, number one, you're going to take longer exposures and you need to move with the sky. This is a really good example. I used to live about 75 miles north of Crater Lake. I took this 300 second exposure and look at how much the night sky moves in 300 seconds, five minutes. Uh, this is the Big Dipper and uh, this is how much it moves. So you got to have something that moves with it if you're going to keep those pinpoint stars uh, and shoot them over and over and over again. And what can you do with the go-to mount? You're going to upgrade, of course, you're going to spend a lot more money. Uh, and up, uh, this is a, a photo set up from my friend uh, John Udart. Uh, this is all the, also the same kind of mount that I have. It's the EQ6R Pro. Uh, runs about a couple thousand dollars, uh, maybe 2100 by now. Um, but what do you get? You get longer exposures. The big thing is you get an automated computerized map of the sky. If you tell it go to this star, it's going to go to that star after you do your polar alignment. Um, it gives you a lot greater stability, gives you guiding success. Um, it's portable. It's not easily a portable, but it's portable. And uh, John told me that the moment uh, he upgraded from the star tracker to uh, to this setup and went into Nina, which is one of the uh, image capture softwares and said, go to this star, and went. It, he said that paid for itself. It made it so much easier. OK, again, I said length of exposure. Here's an image that took 555 shots to make, uh, and then a lot of time in post-processing to create. Um, it was taken on a go-to mount. Uh, again, here's our horse head in Flame Nebula. Um, this was taken with narrow band filters. And uh, like I said, I did a lot of work in um, post-processing software to, to create this. Um, so here, on the picture on the left, uh, to the picture on the right, it took me about 18 months to kind of progress and learn the skills to go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. Uh, it also took about eight grand in, in money to, to get the gear to do that. So you just kind of have to know um, that uh, once you start uh, upgrading your, your desires to make... Uh, uh, higher uh, rated photographs, you're going to need to spend some money. So, what kind of options do you have for OTAs and telescopes, things like that? There's a lot of different telescopes out there. Um, there's refractors, reflectors, Newtonians, there's Dobbs, there's SCGs, there's, um, or S, there's SCTs. Uh, you can attach your camera to all these. You can get some for 500 bucks. Some of them cost five grand. A bunch all the way in between. I decided to go with refractors. Um, a refractor is is as close to a long camera lens uh, as you can possibly get. It's a prime type of a lens, so it's not a telephoto. It's a fixed 
uh, focal length. Um, I think you have a lot less light bouncing around um, and a lot uh, better opportunities to capture really nice images. Also, I have two refractors. I have this one, which is a 127 uh, millimeter aperture, uh, 900 and I think 69 uh, focal length. Um, a little bit uh, shorter when I add the flattener reducer to it, but I bought both of them used, um, and that's a great way to save some money. Um, you want to go with an equatorial mount. This is a mount that is, is, it helps you adjust for the latitude that you're in. Um, if you go with a, uh, an alt azimuth mount, you're just not going to be happy with the uh, pictures. It just won't work for astrophotography. Um, again, here's the trackers. A tracker will run you about 400 bucks. Uh, another couple thousand uh, for a camera, uh, another 500, 2000 for a good lens. Uh, and, uh, you know, you need a good tripod. That's going to cost you a little bit of money, too. Uh, here's a, another approach from my friend uh, Phil Jansen. Uh, he's got a 135 millimeter lens on here. He's got a ZWO 533 cooled camera and a nice, easy um, uh, guiding telescope and guiding camera. Um, Phil does a lot of traveling. He puts this in his RV and he goes and he, he uh, loves this approach and um, it's a really good one. Okay, so you're going to get into more intricate or difficult mounts. Um, the, uh, the mount and the telescope on the top, um, a lot more money, a lot more intricate, a lot more, um, a lot more work involved in doing this, but uh, you really, really get the results. Uh, something kind of, kind of entry level, kind of a little bit more than entry level is the EQ6R Pro. Um, you still get a lot of the same uh, opportunities, uh, just not forking out quite as much money. Uh, okay, here, this looks like the spaghetti model from a hurricane. There's so many lines going on here. But uh, it's real easy. I'm just showing you all the different pieces and parts that I have put together on my, uh, on my uh, re refractor. I've got the telescope, of course. I've got a dew heater. Down here in Florida, we have to worry about dew every night we put out our telescope. Uh, I've got my little ASI uh, Plus a mini computer. I've got a guiding scope and camera. I've got another dew heater on that. And I've got another dew heater on my camera. I've got a focal reducer and flattener uh, because, you know, your lenses are rounded. You have to, and you're putting it onto a flat um, sensor. You have to even that out, and then you have to even out the, uh, the distance between that and the sensor. Uh, there's a lot of things involved there. Uh, like I said, I use a filter wheel. Uh, there's seven filters in there, and uh, then you take your pictures through the filters, and then assign a color to the filters. And then there's weights, of course. Um, you need those to, uh, to offset and to balance your, uh, your whole rig. Uh, here's Linwood's setup with the C11. Uh, a lot of people use a car battery for powering in remote locations. Also, Linwood built a cool little weather station that he's got uh, wired into his Google system at home that lets him know when the wind is too windy or if it's raining or things like that. A lot of that kind of stuff happens down here in Florida. And uh, I'll be honest with you, when we set up, uh, it's all automated. We set up and we go to sleep. Um, and there's many, many nights, especially in the winter, when I, I can go to bed at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, get up at 6 or 7 in the morning, um, the uh, rig has shot all night. It's finished up at like 5, 5 30, 6 o'clock. It's parked itself. I go out and I just pull it in or I cover it up and wait for the next night. Uh, you've got uh, little mini computers. The red one is the ASI Air Plus. Uh, I love it. It connects to my iPad. I download an app. Um, the little blue box here, uh, I believe, is a USB hub. That connects to a router, connects to a mini computer, and then uh, you can uh, wirelessly network from your laptop in the comfort of your house. Um, 
there's a lot of different options for cameras. Uh, the ones on the top are uh, cooled cameras uh, with filters. They do make a one-shot color camera. Uh, a lot of them are very, very good. I'll be honest with you. Uh, my friend Linwood convinced me to go with mono and the filters. I'm really happy I did. The results I've seen out of the one-shot color cameras are not quite as good. You do spend less time gathering data, um, but I'll be honest with you, I have not seen the same uh, quality results out of the one-shot color um, as I have out of the mono. Um, there's a, a couple of people that I've seen do it really, really, really good. Uh, John Udart's uh, images uh, in my um, Astro Sig group, I think he's shooting a 533, and those turned out really, really good. Um, but you have to really know what you're doing, and you have to know how to work it up in, uh, in post-processing as well, and John's real good at that. Um, okay, moving along. Um, okay, so why would I want to take pictures rather than just observing the night sky. Observing is okay, it's great, but you're not going to have a, a copy of that memory when you're done looking. For some people, that's okay. For me, again, like I said, I started out being a photographer. Uh, I like doing this. Um, this is why. Here's a great picture of the Orion Nebula that Linwood Ferguson took. 14 hours worth of imaging because you're taking shorter exposures. Um, and don't need quite as long time to image this. This was done in narrowband, and uh, it's an absolutely phenomenal image that uh, Linwood took. Here's another one of the Dolphin Nebula. It's much further out, not quite as bright. Uh, I believe it's pretty low in the sky, um, and it takes a long time to shoot this. Uh, here's one that Dick Cogswell took. Uh, same uh, uh, approach. Um, and a uh, really, really nice image. Uh, here's one of the Pac-Man Nebula. Don't ask me why or how these nebulas get their names. Somebody just starts off with it. It shows up on Astro Bin or shows up on social media, and it kind of catches. Um, Ray Bratton in our, in our Astro group is uh, really into planetary as well as uh, uh, deep sky. Um, he's done a, a lot of uh, shots of Jupiter and Saturn. Here's a couple of them. Uh, here's one by Steve Sandor. Uh, Steve lives in Michigan as well as in, uh, in um, southern Florida. Not sure where this was taken, but that's a really nice image. Uh, another one from Ray of Saturn. Uh, this was taken through the uh, Explore Scientific 127 um, with a, a nice 3X Barlow on it. Um, the uh, solar eclipse of 2017. Uh, we have another one coming up in 2024. I believe it's in April. Um, here's another um, shot of Pleiades from Steve. Pleiades is a really good beginner subject, um, and uh, I like. I like to shoot a lot of the same subjects over and over again as I progress in my skill uh, because I can do them. And guess what? You can add data to data year over year. Um, here's another shot of Steve uh, M101, the uh, Whirlpool um, Nebula with a supernova in it. Uh, here's a shot I took of Andromeda. Uh, this was taken over about five nights, I think, in uh, the fall of uh, 2022. It's one of my favorite images. Again, here's the Horse Head and Flame Nebula. You've seen this a couple of times. Uh, here's the comet that came through uh, the solar system in 2022. Uh, this was a real challenge, not only to take, but also to process. Uh, so if you want something really challenging, uh, wait for another comet to come through our solar system and try to give that a shot. Um, this is a real favorite of uh, several of us called the Rosette Nebula. And um, it just offers so much detail and so much texture in here. Uh, this is one that John Udart did. Really, really cool uh, color palette. Uh, here's another one that I did. Um, 
again, I'm just kind of playing around with color palettes and seeing what I can get out of them, uh, seeing what kind of texture I'm going to get. Uh, this was shot with a wide field um, telescope, my uh, uh, 61 uh, Williams Optic. And I think this year I'm going to try and shoot this with the 127 and get a little bit closer up. Uh, again, here it is. This is shot with the 127, uh, about two and a half hours of data. So this is all you need to really get some neat data um, on, the, uh, on, a, on a, a dark sky object. Here's the uh, Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation. Um, this is taken during the summer of 2023. Uh, again, I'm dodging clouds here, trying to get uh, uh, as much detail as I can. I think I got maybe three or four nights and uh, decided to call that good for the moment. Uh, our good friend, Dr. Mario Mota, he uh, has a 32 inch telescope. Uh, lives in Gloucester, um, Massachusetts, as well as down here in Naples, Florida. And uh, he's done some shooting of the supernova as well. Uh, this is called The Hidden Galaxy, shot by Dick Cogswell. Really nice uh, approach. Same with the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, this is a Veil supernova remnant, so supernova... Uh, implodes and eventually the uh, the nebulas spread out all over. This is one that uh, that Mario took. Uh, we get into M81 and M82. Amazing details with uh, um, and I believe this was taken with two different telescopes, a refractor and a uh, uh, schmidt cassegrain that uh, Linwood has, the C11. Um, so you can use two different uh, types of tools and uh, blend them together to get this kind of data. Uh, here's one Don Bishop did. One John Udart did. Again, a lot of different approaches on the same target, really cool. Um, we get some really cool solar images in our group. Another one from Ray, some cool sunspots. Uh, again, I mentioned the, uh, the witch head. Okay, what else do we have to consider? What else could possibly go wrong? Uh, you got to consider clear nights or cloudy nights. You have to consider the temperature and the dew point. Um, if, if those those two get close to each other, you're going to have problems if you don't have a way to mitigate it. You have to look at light pollution. You have to deal with something called back focus and making sure that your camera is X amount of millimeters from the, um, the lenses. Um, you got to deal with memory gap because guess what? You may only do this like every couple of weeks or every month or so, but depending on clouds and subjects and things like that. So you tend to uh, forget some things when you uh, have to wait that long in between uh, uh, shooting. Um, you have to know the processing. You get all, there are going to be nights when you're going to have data that you just have to throw away because it's just not good. Um, you have to balance your rig and make sure it's perfectly balanced or you're going to get some wonky types of tracking and, and guiding. This is a tool called Astrospheric. We use this to help us prognosticate the weather. It tells you a lot of different things. This is taken from early July. Uh, cloud cover, transparency of the sky, what it looks like. You know, seeing might be things like light pollution or haze or, or uh, water vapor in the sky. Uh, where the wind is, uh, the temperature and dew point. As you can see here, probably about 2 or 3 in the morning, the temperature and the dew point are getting very, very close to each other. That's when you're going to have a real problem with uh, dew on your uh, on your gear if you don't mitigate it. Here's a light pollution map taken from a, a light pollution website. Look at all this light pollution. Um, so you can wonder why people want to go to places like Big Bend, Texas, or some places in Utah or Colorado or Southern uh, Oregon uh, or higher elevation areas to get out of this light. 
Uh, again, this is what it looks like in downtown Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, we like to go to the bottom tip of Florida and get a little bit better skies, but again, we're dealing with a big uh, light glow from Miami down there. Um, this is a map of the uh, dark sky locations in uh, the United States. There are designated dark sky locations. Uh, they've made a very, very big effort in managing their light around the area. And uh, so you might want to Google this and uh, find these locations if you're serious about uh, getting to uh, a dark area. Here's what it looks like. Here's the big difference between uh, a really good sky and a really, really bad sky. Uh, in, in a lot of, uh, you know, city locations, uh, New York City, Chicago, um, you know, Dallas, things like that, Atlanta, you're, you're in an eight or nine. You're not going to see stars at all um, or very, very little stars at all, like a seven. Um, if, you know, if you get into some other suburban areas, I lived in Kansas City for a while. We were probably in a six. Uh, in my area, I, I live uh, north of Fort Myers, Florida. I'm at about a five or a six. Uh, you can get a little further out and get into like a 4.5. Uh, we go to an area called Big Cypress, uh, which is in the southern tip of Florida. It's about a 2.5, so it's pretty good seeing. Um, so what does it really, does it really matter if you go to these skies or you just keep taking these long and long pictures? Well, yeah, it matters. Here's my friend, um, our, our uh, Linwood. Linwood took a comparison shot of M81 and M82. Um, the shot on the bottom was taken from a Bortle 2.5 location in Big Cypress. And the shot on the top was taken from his backyard, a Bortle 6 location in Fort Myers. Uh, really, 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 really shows a big difference in the detail you can get from the same length of exposure in different areas that are darker. I mean, there are stars that you can see in the bottom uh, shot that you cannot see in the top shot. We've got other issues to deal with. I've mentioned back focus a couple of times. This is something you're really going to have to do some research on. Uh, it can uh, just really give you a big headache, um, but just stay diligent, uh, stay focused on it, and you'll get, uh, get it worked through. Find somebody to help you with it if you're having trouble. Uh, again, balancing your gear. Uh, you've got these big, big weights on the end of your, uh, your uh, mount. You've got to figure out uh, how to get them uh, balanced so that the mount is not moving. A lot of people bypass this uh, part of the setup process, but I would suggest that you don't. Uh, also, here's another thing to notice in this picture. This is just a picture I grabbed from the Internet. Uh, if this is uh, if this guy is setting up in a uh, a very uh, hot location like the desert or or you know any location that gets really really hot during the day, uh, you're gonna have, you're gonna have heat waves coming off of that um, that asphalt for a long time, and that might have an impact on the types of uh, images you're gonna be able to take. Something to think about. You have tracking issues. Who knows why? Sometimes things just go wonky and, and uh, you get tracking issues. Here's a couple of images that, um, that uh, just didn't turn out real well. Uh, I tried to do M16 uh, last summer. Didn't work out because I had all these tracking issues. Finally figured out I was getting some uh, uh, interference from a palm tree in my backyard. Uh, so you can see on the left, not so good. On the right, looked a lot better. Finally got it fixed. We've got satellites in the sky. It's, it's hard to believe how many satellites there are in the sky. Um, I've got an estimation here, 7,700 satellites as of May in 2023. This is what it does. I mean, this is crazy. I asked my colleagues for some pictures, and this is what they sent. Airplanes, too. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm on the, uh, the downwind approach for uh, a local airport. Uh, some of you guys might be as well. You're going to get some airplanes getting through your shots. 
Uh, a lot of times you might want to just not use that shot. Sometimes your software can uh, get them out, um, but you're going to have to deal with that. That's just the way it works. Noise. I mentioned it before. When you take longer exposures, you're going to have noise in the image uh, because you're using a higher ISO or a higher gain. You can mitigate the noise by using noise reduction software. You have to be really, really good at processing software. Uh, you're going to make some decisions on what to use for your processing. Just the way you make decisions on what you do for your image at acquisition. Um, the best ones like PixInsight, they will, they'll just become your best friend because they really help you evaluate your subs. Uh, they'll help you stack them, remove the artifacts. Um, they'll help you match your stars to a known color database. Uh, they'll help you assign uh, colors to filters and work through the, uh, the management of your image. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, there is a learning curve involved in learning any of these types of softwares. Uh, don't go after the freebies right away. Do some research. I started with Astro Pixel Processor, and then I moved to PixInsight and uh, it's I'm still learning and I've been doing it almost a year now okay so what can ha happen what are some crazy things that have happened to us oh maybe like you get to your dark sky area and you've realized you forgot your battery source that's like 75 miles away uh, or you get to your dark sky area that's near the Everglades and you forgot your bug spray um, or you finally got several nights of data and uh, you leave your, your setup out uh, trying to get some more data the next night. A huge gust of wind comes over and blows over your entire rig. You have to send your mount to the, uh, to the mount hospital and get it fixed. Um, or your neighbor adds some safety lights in your perfectly safe neighborhood. Um, drives me nuts. After months and months and months of cloudy skies, you finally get some data. And guess what? You've forgotten how to use your processing software. You have to go back and look at your, your workflow and look at some YouTubes and things like that. Again, you may only get like 12, 15, 20 images a year. Uh, if you can do this full time and you're in a dark sky area that's clear all the time, uh, I've got a friend in, in Utah that's able to do this. You might get 10 images a month, but for most of us, that just doesn't happen. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that, that can get wrong with your image uh, acquisition software. Uh, ASI or Nina might not like your rig. I'll be honest with you, that doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's a really pain in the backside to, to have to deal with. But it happens. You just kind of have to stick with it and get after it. Um, guiding errors is a really big uh, uh, issue that a lot of people just go nutso about. Um, I kind of take it in stride, uh, manage the issue. Sometimes I have to shut down, start all over again. Um, simple things like, did you take off the lens cap? Have you wiped your uh, telescope lenses uh, free of uh, last night's dew or things like that? Is your dew heater working? Uh, really simple things that uh, just can confound you if you don't uh, remember what you're doing. You ever get a comment from your spouse or your wife like, why are you spending all this money for Astro Gear when you can just download the James Webb Space Telescope or Hubble data for free? Um, it's not the same as setting up the rig in our own backyard. Um, I, I, I'm guilty of this one. I tell my wife, I've, I've got to go out and do polar alignment. I'll be back in a few minutes. And finally, it takes me 45 minutes or an hour and I'm back. And I've probably got a few more uh, extra mosquito bites to add to uh, my collection. Um, or, you know, in an area where you've got uh, uh, lawn irrigation, you forget that you've got the lawn irrigation starts at 5 in the morning. You've got to scramble out there to keep your gear from getting uh, 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 sprinklers. Um, don't forget the simple things like removing a lens cap when you're balancing or removing it. Uh, I had a situation, you know, the, 
the lens cover that you slide over your telescope. I forgot to slide it over a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I came out in the morning to get my telescope. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I lost all my data. Uh, turned out fine, but, you know, simple things that you can easily forget. Here's some lessons learned from some of my colleagues that um, um, I depend on and we work together. Um, John said that the EQ6R Pro was a really big step up from the Star Adventure. So he started off like I did. Matter of fact, I loaned him my Star Adventure and he took a real methodical approach to it. Um, a, a really good um, comment that the learning curve is steep on both the hardware and the software side uh, of using a German equatorial mount. Just take, take it baby steps. Just go a little bit at a time. Set your goals of learning one or two little simple things each night. And after, you know, a couple of weeks, you're, those things become uh, old hat and you're moving on to something else. Big thing John brings up here, obviously, is budget. I've mentioned um, several times that this can be a very expensive hobby. Um, it can be. Uh, you can do it um, affordably. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really big about trying to watch what I spend on this, but I'll be honest with you. As much as you set a budget, sometimes you're just going to have to spend something else um, you know, I had an occasion last year where my telescope kept banging into the tripod leg and I found out if I add a, an 8-inch uh, mount or 8-inch uh, extension pier to it, I wouldn't have that problem. Bing, there's 90 bucks. Uh, you need an extra weight for your telescope, 45 bucks. Simple things like that. It just continues to add up the cost of what it takes to do this. A um, couple of comments. Uh, I, I really think it's a good idea to take your time to determine your own path. The stars are still going to be there uh, unless it's a comet going through the solar system. Everything else is, is pretty much going to be the same. Um, really work to understand the photography. Uh, really work to understand the fact that you're pretty much in a data collection world um, and that your, your, your work with the photography side kind of starts when you start processing and stacking these images. But you have to know how long to expose for, what types of filters work best, things like that. It's really good to understand image exposure and color as well. Um, I suggest you really study the astronomy. Take a class. There's a lot of uh, really good online classes. Uh, I know Richard Bell at the Kalamazoo um, Camera Club in Michigan offers a great class. I've taken it a couple times. Um, again, you have to be really fiercely committed to the science of astronomy and the art of photography. This is an art. Nobody really, really knows what colors there are out there. We're assigning the colors based on what we think things might look like or what we think might look good. Um, some things I've observed from Ray. Um, Ray started out working with a rig that was really, really, really too heavy for him. He'd had some shoulder issues. And um, so he decided to go with a smaller rig that wasn't quite as heavy to carry around. Um, that helped out a lot. Um, Ray is one who has learned how to kind of adapt and move from one technology to another. Uh, he's a real uh, uh, good... Um, astrophotographer from the prospect of learning new technology and adapting to it. Um, Ray's another one who likes to just get out there, set up, shoot for a couple of hours and bring his stuff in and then go do the same thing again the next night and you end up with some great nights. Um, here's another example of the Heart Nebula he shot a couple of nights in a row and you're just going out shooting three or four hours and uh, you know he ends up with a really nice shot. Um, good friend Linwood has a lot of great comments. The big thing I think is really, really important to, to remember here is that you have to have a realistic idea of what your skies are like, what your equipment is like, what you can really achieve. Um, we're constantly joking about setting up our gear and buying some land in a dark sky area. Uh, I'd love to do that in New Mexico or Utah or whatever, but then you know, you're going to, you also have to fiddle with things and 
so you're kind of weighing, you know, what what's the most important part of of doing all of this um, hobby? Uh, is it more fun to just set up your gear in your backyard, or is it more fun to just get the data uh, from wherever you can get good data and do the processing? Um, again, have the insatiable desire to see what's in the sky. There are some amazing things hidden in the sky that you can't see from just looking through a telescope. You have to look through the telescope with your camera and continue to take pictures. Um, so, in summary, why do we do this? Because we do have an insatiable desire in, to see what's hidden in the sky. We have a personal relationship with the night sky. Like I said, I love sitting out there um, just looking at the night sky. I love sitting out uh, outside looking to the northeast in in August and waiting for the Perseids to, to start their show. Um, we like showing our work and sharing our work. Um, we like helping others learn and showing others how we do things. Um, and we seek each other out. Um, we seek each other out to meet, to interact. We like hanging out with like-minded people. Um, and in doing this, we create our own fellowship. We create our own support system for this crazy addiction type of hobby. So um, anyhow, that's what I've got to uh, share with you today. Uh, please shoot me a note if you have any questions. Um, I appreciate you watching and look forward to interacting with you again at some other time.